I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. This email is from a woman living in East Texas. The Bigfoot activity around her property is still ongoing. This is her story. I live close to the town of Palestine, Texas, about seven miles out in the country, close to the Trinity River. There are many pastures, creeks, and ponds amid a dense hardwood forest with sparse pines. The wildlife is abundant, and predator animals are also abundant. We moved here 31 years ago for my husband's work. We enjoyed our new home and the country setting. Soon, we heard our first extremely long, extremely loud, angry, bellowing howl one evening. I knew exactly what it was. Although my husband promptly brushed me off because I told him it was a Bigfoot, he went into the house, leaving me outside to watch the kids play. It wasn't long before there were instances of our house being hit with rocks and bumped in the night. Strange chattering and sounds of a baby crying and a woman hollering in the wee hours of the night behind the house at the edge of the woods. I knew instantly it was a lure to doom and we dared not go out. Nothing was ever said about any woman or baby being distressed or needing help by any neighbor. One day the kids and I were picking blackberries by the roadside and decided to go take a look by the creek. There on the creek bank, in the red clay, was a huge bare footprint, deep in the mud. We went back home. Several years later, I was riding to the back of the small neighborhood to take my son's friend home. In the distance, squatting at a burn pile, was a huge cone-head, hairy beast, digging in an old burnt food can. I stopped the van and stared at him in awe as he stood up and turned to glare at me. He snarled and bore his teeth, then hurriedly went to the barbed wire fence and stepped over it like it was a pebble on the ground. He was every bit seven and a half feet tall. He was massive and dark brown. He must have been well taken care of by the females in the group because his hair was groomed, even on his head. He was short-haired and muscle-bound, but the look in his eyes was murderously evil and it made me fear for my children's safety while playing outside. Last January, I was letting my dogs out of the house for a bit, and I got that feeling you get when someone's staring a hole in you. I looked up, and across the road in the ditch is a female, just standing there staring at me. We locked eyes for a few seconds before she bolted down the road so fast that she actually looked like her body was dissipating. She was about six foot, black, a fringe of long hair on her arms and long stringy hair all over. I've had many more visits and a couple more sightings, Knocks in the woods, whoops and whistles and owl calls, red eyes peering from the woods at night. I thought about moving, but they've never hurt me, although their shenanigans around my place are annoying and sometimes frightening. I hope we can coexist peacefully here. DMC Texas Hill Country, Bandera County, Texas I grew up in one of those tiny towns around the Texas Hill Country in Bandera County. As a kid back in the late 1970s, I used to play with a neighbor lady's grandson who would come every summer from Baltimore, Maryland to stay with her for two weeks. He was a real city boy. One afternoon, I went to visit the neighbor boy who was there visiting. He was a bit spoiled and was allowed to stay up until 4 or 5 a.m. every night watching TV and then sleep until early afternoon the next day. But this day, he was freaked out because he told me that the night before, around 3 a.m., he happened to look out his window and saw a huge man-thing walk very briskly down another neighbor's long driveway and disappear into the darkness and woods behind their house. This neighbor had a streetlight on their carport that lit the whole area at night where he saw the thing. His view was unobstructed for about 75 yards. He said the thing covered the 50 or 60 yard walk in a few seconds. When I first began to believe him was when we were out dirt biking a day or two later down a long, desolate country road on my dirt bike. He kept asking me when we were going to turn around. We got to the end of the road and I killed the bike and I pretended like it wouldn't start. The poor kid was scanning the brush like he was scared to death something would come out and get us. He was panicking and crying and saying that he had to get out of there because we have these things roaming around. Seeing him so freaked out got me a little freaked out too and we left. We were about 11 or 12 years old. 
I now live in San Antonio. Last winter, our 10 o'clock news had a brief blurb about two men witnessing either one or two Sasquatches chasing deer off of Highway 151, which is a little connector road that runs on the outskirts of town. This subject is fascinating. I learned after reading a lot of stories that they don't just dwell in tall forests. There are a lot of sightings in low brush country. I wish I had more info on the deer chasing incident. Thanks. Lariat 1. Hi. I used to hunt a property in Texas close to Ranger Mountain. It was very rugged and had thick brush and steep canyons. Anyway, the landowner told me when he was in high school he and a friend of his were deer hunting one evening and both had decided to meet after dark on a dirt road to head back to their vehicle. He told me they met and were about to leave when they heard what he said was a blood-curdling scream very close to him. He said they had just started running and got out of there. I've been told another time when someone else heard this scary scream at night, also when I was living in Texas. The people thought it was a mountain lion that sounded like a woman screaming. I also used to hunt on some property close to Lake Whitney. This was owned by the Army Corps of Engineers. I was speaking to a lady one day walking her dog on a road, and I started talking to her to find out where some good hunting might be since she was a local. I asked her if there were any mountain lions around there, and she told me that one time she thought there was one coming around at night and would dig in some of the compost piles to get dead fish remains. She told me all the dogs in the area would be scared when this thing came around and would not make a sound. She said normally they would bark at night. I asked her this because in all my years in the woods, I've never seen so many skeletons of dead carnivores in the woods. I found dead bobcat bones and skulls, coyotes, and dogs. It was weird to me to find so many bones that did not belong to animals like deer or rabbits or other prey animals. This may not be anything, but I thought I would mention it. There is one more experience I had when I was in Wyoming in the Medicine Bow National Forest. I was fishing one early morning at the far end of a reservoir. I was catching some good brown trout. I kept getting this feeling that I was being watched from behind the thick tree line. Every now and then I would glance back to make sure nothing was coming. At the time I had very bad hearing and did not have hearing aids at the time, but I heard a loud branch snap from inside the tree line. It had to be big because I only have about 50% hearing. I thought that it was an elk because the sound was so loud. Anyway, I looked back but could not see anything. I just thought that whatever was watching me decided to move on. I normally check that kind of stuff out by going into the woods and finding the source, but I guess I was a little scared because I didn't have a gun with me. Thank you. Mario Perez Anderson County, Texas, August 2001 On August 5, 2001, at 3.13 a.m. on U.S. Highway 287, which is 31 miles west of Palestine, Texas, I was traveling westbound at 65 miles per hour when I saw what looked like a bear cub or a very large dog sitting in the middle of the road. I slowed down to 15 miles per hour, hit my high beams, and stopped about 20 yards away from the animal. I put on my four-way flashers and turned on my interior spotlight. As I looked up, I saw a huge bipedal creature that I will call Bigfoot. It walked from the soft shoulder of the road to the animal in the road. As he, I'm pretty sure it was a male, walked in front of my tractor, he shielded his eyes, not seemingly out of shyness, but more as an effort to protect his eyes from the bright lights. I reduced my high beams to low beam, but decided not to turn them off as I was in the middle of the highway. I was doing my best to protect them by blocking the road with my tractor trailer. The big male went over to what I realized was a toddler. He grabbed its shoulder and attempted to grab the little one's arm. The little one scooted away like a child trying to get away from a parent that wants the child to go somewhere and the child doesn't want to go. The little one had greater agility than the big male. The little one squirmed, scrambled, and scooted further up the road from where they were. Then something caught my eye and ear directly next to my driver's window. I casually looked over, and within two feet of my face was a female. No doubt female. She had nursing breasts. Her eyes were almost even with my eye level. 
I measured from where the top of her head came to my mirror. It was seven feet, four inches tall. The male was at least one foot taller than her, plus some. She had a gamey smell, but didn't stink. Immediately upon seeing her, I smiled with all the teeth I have. From the interior spotlight, which was pointed down toward my lap, I was sure she was able to see me clearly. I certainly saw her clearly, so clearly I could smell and feel her breath. I particularly noticed the volume of air that she breathed, not out of breath or even breathing heavy, just a large volume of air with each breath. I again smiled at her and asked, Is the baby okay? She slowly smiled back at me. I noticed a dental anomaly. Either she had a double row of teeth or the crowns of her teeth were split on the top center to give the impression of two rows of teeth. She then reached into the tractor and stroked my beard like I do when I'm thinking. My beard is mid-chest length and multicolored. It was then I realized the large male head was identical to mine, although his beard was shorter. The female had thin facial hair on her chin. The rest of his hair was dark brown with traces of gray or white on his shoulders, back and chest. She was a mixture of brown and reddish brown, mostly reddish brown. As she took her hand off my beard and took her hand out of my tractor, I extended my hand out to her. She sandwiched my hand between her two hands. Her hands were two to three times larger than mine. Her hands felt like roughneck work gloves, rough leather. At this point, she gave me a soulful look. From her facial expressions and her watery eyes, I think she was saying thanks for not running over my baby. The eyes were not dead eyes. They were bright and moist, just very dark brown, not black. The large male had the child under its arm like a sack of potatoes. He never looked directly at me as I watched him walk back into the tree line. I noticed at least three more. I suspected even more at the tree line. They ranged from the height of the female to slightly shorter, but none came close to the size of the female. Please don't use my name. I have no objections to your use of this report, but please don't use my name. I had no belief in what I saw until I saw it, and I had no fear of these creatures. I believe any use of deadly force would have been borderline homicide, no doubt in my mind. 21 years of investigating experience teaches you to observe, remember as much as you can, and immediately write it down. And that's what I've done. The encounter ended at 3.17 a.m. I have thought of 10 million things that I coulda, woulda, shoulda done if given the opportunity again. I know, however... This was a a once-in-a-lifetime event. Texas Hill Country, 1973 In the summer of 1973, five of us all had a day off together. Taking a rifle with us, we went to the ranch of one of the guy's grandfather. We did a little shooting and then decided to go down the road and stop by another ranch where we just hung out and did a little exploring. The sun went down and we decided to head for home in San Antonio. We went down a dirt road and had gone a couple of miles when we had a flat tire. We were in an old Rambler station wagon. As we were changing the tire, we all noticed that the night sounds could be heard on the right side of the road, but there was silence on the left. We really didn't worry about that because one of the guys said that maybe a predator was out in the bush. We did smell a strange odor, but it was faint and we thought maybe something had died. When the tire was changed, we all climbed in. The car was started, put into drive, and allowed to just accelerate on its own. One guy drove, another sat next to him. I was in the middle seat alone, and the two other guys stood on the lower tailgate, one with the rifle and one with a very good spotlight. It was obvious what they were doing. As the car started to creep ahead, I noticed movement to my left and turned around to the back to say something. It was at this time that the guy holding the flashlight said, Look at the size of that son of a... Almost instantly, I saw the guy with the rifle raise it and fire. All I could see at that close range was about chest to pelvis of a huge hairy thing that turned sideways when the gun went off. There was enough light to see short blackish brown hair, and as the car continued moving, I heard a grunt and saw the thing for the first time. The hands were raised to the sides and were hairless. The head appeared domed, the eyes glowed red, and the teeth, or some of them, were pointed. 
The guys on the tailgate both ducked into the car, but the light remained trained on this thing. It took a couple of steps toward us, then turned and ran like a man to what we call a deer-proof fence. It grasped the top three or four strands of wire and jerked them down. It then vaulted the fence. I remember hearing a sound like the wires popping, but I couldn't be sure. The driver started to stop, but we screamed to floor it, and we drove at a high rate of speed back to the highway. We stopped to discuss what we had seen. The driver had been looking in his rearview mirror and really saw just a shape. The front seat passenger had pulled himself up and out of the window and in shock had nearly fallen out. I witnessed none of this because I was turned around in the seat and was leaning way over trying to see more out of the back of the car. We all went to work the next day. My workplace was a fast food place frequented by DPS highway patrol people who worked on the driver's license bureau. We told them the story. They later said they talked to a couple of folks who said they saw something weird and that was about it. We all went back out there but never saw anything again. We did hear stories about two more sightings, but I can't verify them. What we saw is still a mystery. The nearest water source was a confluence of creeks about one mile away, and there was a beautiful creek about a mile or so in the other direction. The closest city is San Antonio, closest small town, Bourne. I never saw the guys again after that summer, except for one. I ran into him about six years ago, and the first thing he said was, Remember the night when we saw that creature? FRC Fort Bend County, Texas A friend of mine, a special ed teacher in Texas, told me about a sighting as reported by two of her students. This is the teacher's story. Two of my gifted and talented class students lived in a subdivision that had a tributary of the Brazos River and lots of cover for the deer and other wildlife. The two girls, who are seniors in high school now, were the only players on the ninth hole of a golf course. One of them was on the putting green while the other waited beside their golf cart. Both girls heard a horrible commotion in the woods to the left of the green. Less than 30 yards away and on the other side of the green, a tall, hairy, long-armed thing suddenly ran into the cleared area, crossed the trail leading back to the clubhouse. He, the thing, stopped, looked at the girls, they were frozen with shock. Because I've told their class Bigfoot stories and we had a number of intelligent discussions about these creatures, the girls felt sure they were looking at one. It's not uncommon. There have been sightings of Bigfoot in our county west of Houston, Texas in the past. It happened around 6 p.m. on May 16th, about four years ago on the golf course, ninth hole at Sienna Plantation Subdivision in the southeast corner of Fort Bend County. The creek which ran through the golf course was a tributary of the Brazos River. There was a sighting along this river farther east and south in Brazoria County. There have been Bigfoot sightings in both counties, but not recent ones. I've lost touch with these two girls. Both are now seniors in high school here in Fort Bend County. I tried to get them to report the incident, but they feared their parents wouldn't let them play at the golf course where it happened. That's where it will probably need to stand, unfortunately. No name by request. Marion County, Texas I don't exactly remember when this happened, just that it was in the fall. At that time, I lived in Marion County, Texas, and was out in the woods with my cousin. We were on our way to our older brother's fort when we saw something that changed our lives forever. First, I think I'll give you a little background. My older brother was in high school at the time and was into cryptozoology. Because of this, I was mildly interested because he would tell me stories that he hoped would scare me. I was around 8 or 10, so pretty much anything could scare me. Now, we lived in the Piney Woods, so we were used to weird sounds and all sorts of critters. So me and my cousin, who was only two years older than me, would regularly go walking in the woods. To get to my brother's fort, you had to go through some thick woods before you got to a point where the trees thinned out. After that was a good slope with a creek at the bottom, then a slope back up. His fort was at the top of this slope. For some reason, there was a lot of big rocks in this area. We would use them for cover when we would fight with each other. But when we came out of the thicker woods, we noticed something behind one of those rocks. 
The rock is maybe two to three feet tall. When we stopped and looked at it to see what it was, it stood up. It was maybe six feet tall, black hair and long arms. As soon as it noticed us, it turned and ran away really fast. This all happened within a few seconds. The first thing we did was look at each other. Both our faces were pale white, and at the same time we said, Bear! We ran through the woods home as fast as we could. Now, if you've ever been in East Texas and have tried to go through some of those woods, you can understand how big of a deal this is. We got home yelling, Bear! Bear! The only one home was my brother. He asked what we saw. We described it for him. He only replied with, That's no bear. We waited for my parents to get home, and they said it was probably a bear. After several years of looking into this, the only thing that matches what I saw was a juvenile Sasquatch. This happened in fall, so it might go in with the theory of migration according to the season. Ever since we saw what we saw, I have not been able to go in the deep woods by myself anymore. My cousin, who used to spend time outside all the time, never ever does anymore. This experience changed our lives. And sometimes, as we go down a road just south of our sighting location, I sometimes get that ominous feeling of being watched. What makes it worse is that I know it's out there. A.A. Navarro County, Carsicana, Texas I first encountered this creature when I was 10 years old, living with my family outside of Corsicana, Texas, in a remote area where I would walk with my dogs every day to a small pond located at the back of our property. This one particular day, I thought it was strange because the dogs refused to go with me. I went anyway. I had almost made it to the pond when I looked up and noticed this creature watching me. It was leaning with its back against a tree. I stood there and stared back at it for a while, noticing its huge shoulders and height. Then I turned and ran because it appeared to take a step towards me. I looked back to see if it was chasing me, and it was gone. This creature was only an estimated 200 yards from me. I can still go back to the original place and measure the distance. It could have easily caught me if it wanted to. I ran into the house and told my mother what happened. No one believed me. Later that year, two ladies driving home from church had an encounter when one ran across the highway in front of them. The Dallas Times-Herald newspaper reporters did an investigation and found tracks in the creek bottom. They made plaster casts and printed an article in the paper. I didn't see it again for a couple of years. After that experience, I really didn't go outside much unless someone else was with me. My brother experienced rocks being beaten together when we went to the pond. After telling my father, he decided we should not go to the pond area anymore. I did hear it scream, and it was something I will never forget. The area we lived in was mostly flat pasture land, but there was a creek that ran in front of and beside our property called Little Rush Creek. It stayed dry most of the time. When I heard it scream, it appeared to be coming from the creek area. I did find a hair sample on a barbed wire fence that separated our property. It was about six inches long and matted at one end. The color was orangutan red. I brought it in the house and showed it to my mother. Once again, she didn't believe me. I kept it for a while, but when we moved, I left it behind in our old house. I wish I still had it. When we moved, we went back for our last load and decided to spend one last night in our old house. It was mid-October. After feeding our dogs outside, my brother went to the local store, which was about five miles away, to get something for us to eat. My father decided he wanted to build a fire in the old wood stove we had. I gathered some small pieces of wood for kindling and sat down on a swing in the front yard. It was dark outside, but our yard light was on. My father was chopping up the kindling into smaller pieces with a hammer and screwdriver. He would occasionally miss and hit the hammer on the concrete steps. I noticed something big running toward the back of the house. I looked for a moment to see what it was. The dogs were still eating and didn't notice anything. When I saw it move again, I could see the tufts of hair moving on its legs. At that point, I knew exactly what it was. I yelled at the dogs to get it because it was quickly coming around the side of the house. It was looking in the windows. My dogs barked once, then seemed to get the scent and went under the house and started whining at it. 
I felt bad putting them in between, but I had to think fast. My father didn't know what was going on. I kept calm and told him to get in the house. He asked why. I just said, trust me and get in the house. The dogs were not scared of anything except this creature. They were hunting dogs, but wouldn't go near this animal. I explained what was outside and told him to call the sheriff. Instead, he called the local store and asked them to send my brother home as soon as he gets there. My brother came home and said he didn't see anything, but was not told over the phone what to look for. I told my mother and dad to talk in a calm voice because it was looking through the windows at us, and I didn't want to alarm it. The curtains had been taken down when we moved, so I tried to keep calm and not look out the windows for fear of what I might see. The entire time, the dogs outside were silent. Later that night, my mother and I were asleep in her room. I woke up when the room went dark. I could see the outline of this creature looking at me through the window. It never screamed or beat on the side of the house. It never growled. It only seemed to be curious and non-aggressive. I asked my father to buy me a camera with a telescopic lens so I could take pictures of it, but he never did. I wanted to prove their existence, even at a very young age. I also had another experience when I was living in Kaufman, Texas, when I noticed one walking from the neighbor's barn one morning. I could actually see the movement of its arms. It walked hunched over. I screamed at my brother to come outside and quickly grab the binoculars. We both saw it disappear into the woods. This one appeared to be more aggressive. I heard it scream also, along with my two brothers one night. When it screamed, once again, my dogs didn't utter a sound. I had two horses that I rode often. I was riding at night once when my horse got spooked. There was a full moon and I decided to ride down the road. I hadn't gone far when I noticed my horse starting to get scared. He could smell something and he eventually came to a complete stop in the road. My horse turned and I could not slow him down. This was a well-seasoned horse that was a working cattle horse purchased from a ranch in Colorado. If it had been a less experienced horse, I may have been thrown that night. I don't know what scared him, but I did have my sighting shortly after that night. I have so many unanswered questions about this creature. I want to know why dogs are used to hunting wild hogs or bears won't go near this creature. Stories go back many decades describing the same creature, but we still consider it undiscovered. Thank you, S. Wagner. Texas Ranger Nelson Lee, 1850. An interesting excerpt from his book, Three Years Among the Comanches, The Story of Being Held Captive by Comanches, circa 1850. During the summer of 1850, the Indians made their home in the Rocky Mountains, maybe the Dakotas or Utah, as far as I could tell from reading. This is when the Texas Ranger finally made his escape, mounted a good horse and followed by a mule the whole way. The Ranger tells of butchering the mule for food in a very dense stand of timber he was hiding in that night, and then the terror that ensued at his bloody campsite. He links limb crashing and screaming behavior to panthers and wolves. Predators approach silently, and to think a wolf or panther would make a racket crashing around in the bush would be a stretch. Panthers usually stalk silently. I guess it takes a lot to scare a Texas Ranger. He was terrified. His story follows. I sat down on the buffalo hide at the foot of a cedar tree and leaned against its trunk. Here, a new terror awaited me I had not anticipated. The mule's blood had been scented by wild beasts, wolves and panthers, which began to scream. Nearer and nearer they approached until the horse snuffed and snorted and I could hear their teeth snap and the dry sticks crackle beneath their feet. A dozen times I was on the point of ascending the tree, momentarily expecting to be attacked. With such a crash would they break through the thicket that many times I bounded to my feet, thinking the Indians had found me. It was a fearful night, and the most fearful sound that has ever fallen on my ears is the scream of the panther, so like it is to the plaintive ongoing shriek of a human being. The fortunate resolution I had taken to build a fire undoubtedly kept them off. That night taught me a lesson, not thenceforward to be forgotten. That is to say, never camp where I killed my game. Texas Ranger Nelson Lee, circa 1850. 
Thanks for listening. Be sure to watch the three-hour December prize giveaway video. Same as before, watch the video and comment the secret word and your favorite story. Happy holidays and good luck.